the title of my presentation is Formam Serviac Cipiens or Plenus Gratiae et Veritatis, This Apparent Dilemma in Aquinas Exegesis. In his Super Epistolum at Philippenses Lectura, St. Thomas Aquinas presents truly illuminating and profound understanding of expression Forma Servi Accipiens, uh, Philippians 2.7. Uh, this is the, the part of this very famous uh, song of Kenosis or hymn of Kenosis, about Kenosis. Among others, in his analysis of human nature assumed by Son of God, Aquinas includes a characterization taken from John's prologue where incarnate word is described as plenus gratiae et veritatis, John 1.14. How does Thomas manage to unite these two Christological traditions? After all, Philippians 2.6.11 first discusses Christ's humiliation, humiliatio in Latin, and only later moves on to his exaltation, exaltatio. While in John's prologue, though the concept of Logos humiliation is clearly visible, incarnate word from the beginning partakes in glory of the Father and is full of grace and truth. I quote, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. That's John 1.14. In John's Gospel, the depiction of incarnate word as the one who is plenus gratiae et veritatis refers to his existence already before resurrection and ascension. Meanwhile, in Philippians 2, 6, 11, Christ, existing in form of a servant, experiences exaltatio because he, I quote, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Do not we face a dilemma here, either canonic vision of Christ, as expressed by Paul in Philippians 2.7, or John's vision, as taken from John 1.14. In this paper, I would like to show that for Aquinas, this dilemma is only apparent, which he proves by using his principles of biblical exegesis. Certainly, the issue of relationship be between Pauline and Joannine Christology, as presented in St. Thomas' works, deserves a separate monograph. Here I do not have such lofty ambitions, and I only intend to pay attention to one very specific question. Of course, this problem, what's the relation between uh, Pauline Christology and Joannine Christology, is a huge uh, discussed for uh, years, so I will just uh, show uh, one, I will just pay attention to one specific question. Three aspects of forma servi, the first point. Aquinas divides Philippians 2, 6, 11 into three parts. Maestas, humiliatio, and exaltatio. Expression forma servi is located in the part concerning Christ's salvific humiliation. According to St. Thomas, this humiliation occurred in two stages. Firstly, when Christ existing in forma Dei assumed human nature. This was mysterium incarnationis. Secondly, when he obediently died on the cross, this was mysterium passionis. Thus, Aquinas considers the notion of forma servi analyzed here as located in the section dedicated to Christ's humiliation in the mystery of incarnation. Taking on the form of a servant by the one who exists in forma Dei is therefore a key to understand the kenosis of incarnation while his salvific obedience allows to discover the meaning of his passion and death. Bringing this all together, we can say that according to Aquinas, this taking the form of a servant consists in three aspects. The first, it is assumption of something created, namely of human nature, which is united with the person of the Godhead. Second, it is assumption of human nature in its specific form, having some defects. And third, 
It is assumption of human nature which has some defects, but is also full of grace and truth. This approach to the notion of forma servi can be called an integral one. So in these three points I have characterized briefly three aspects of the notion of forma servi which can be identified not only in the commentary on the letter to Philippians, but also in other works by Aquinas. Now I will examine each of these points more closely. First point. Taking form of a servant denotes assumption of created human nature, body and soul, together with all the properties belonging to his species. In this case, Aquinas discusses human nature without further qualifications, stating only that this nature is created and that it serves God like all creation. In other words, this broadest meaning of forma servi consists in analyzing this notion from the point of view that assumed human nature is created. Homo enim, uh, I quote Aquinas, Homo enim ex sua creatione est servus dei, et natura humana est forma servi. It is worth noting that recognition of this aspect of forma servi allows Aquinas to identify in why of one of the meanings of God's kenosis. Son of God, in the act of exinanitio, kenosis, assumed created nature into hypostatic union. By this assumption of human nature, he obtained a new mode of existence. Thus, incarnation, understood as kenosis, did not mean resigning of some attributes of divine nature, but assumption of human nature. Hence, it is assumptio, not deprivation of some kind, that constitutes the essence of the incarnation's kenosis. For Aquinas, who put so much stress on the existence of fundamental difference between creator and his creation, the fact that in hypostatic union the world assumed created nature shows an inconceivably deep kenosis of God. By assuming human nature, the world, which is fullness itself, assumed what is empty, inanis, and what as creation as is submitted to him. So Thomas is, uh, um, Thomas, uh, uh, is uh, very sensitive to this difference between creator and creation, so uh, to uh, this assumption of created nature to the hypostatic union is a huge kenosis uh, because the difference between God and creation is so, uh, so vast. And the second point. Forma servi reserve, uh, rever, refers to human nature in its specific form namely the one that enables the word of God to bring salvation by obedience, passion and death. This approach to the form of a servant focuses on the defects, defectus, inherent to this nature. Son of God assumed forma servi in order to be able to suffer for our salvation. Therefore, in this narrower sense of this notion, Aquinas emphasizes Christ's conformity with everything belonging to the weak human nature, of course, with the exception of sin. Here we encounter second way of understanding kenosis, according to Aquinas. The first aspect of exinanitio kenosis consists in assuming created human nature. Second one refers to assuming its specific form, namely with some defects. In his commentary to the letter to Philippians, Aquinas does not specify which defects he is referring to. They are most exhaustively discussed in Summa Theologiae. Third, the notion of forma servi refers also to human nature, which, though defected, has all the perfections of grace and knowledge that are needed to complete the salvific plan. This is precisely the integral approach to the form of a servant, 
consisting of seeing Christ's human nature as full of grace and truth, without which forma servi cannot be understood as mean of salvation. St. Thomas' intent is clear. God's assumption of human nature into the hypostatic union did not bring any change into divine nature, but it changed human nature. And it was a change for the better, I quote Aquinas, mutata est in melius, quia impleta est gloria et veritate. For this nature was filled with grace and truth. Inclusion of John 1.14 into this explanation of forma servi is a very significant clarification. Firstly, it gives a fuller picture of the form of a servant. Existence in this form denotes not only assumption of human nature with its defects, but also being filled with grace and consequently changing this nature for better. Secondly, it clarifies the logic of kenosis. God assumes human nature not nature to transform it, rather than to transform his own divine nature. Uh, second paragraph, Isaiah 42.1 as a bridge between Philippians 2.7 and John 1.14. It seems that in Aquinas' interpretation of the meaning of forma servi, the issue raising the most serious doubts is the integral understanding of this notion, namely the one linking it to the phrase plenus gratia et veritatis. Should not the notion of forma servi be, be associated with canotic aspect of the incarnation? Is not such attempt to join the theology of Philippians 2, 6, 11 with the tradition of Joannine Christology too hasty and far-fetched, therefore distorting distorting the original meaning of this passage. However, St. Thomas seems to be convinced that putting the expression forma servi in its proper context, namely finding its source in the Old Testament, fully justifies the integral approach to this notion. In his commentary on the letter to Philippians, Aquinas uses Isaiah 42.1 to join Philippians 2.7 with John 1.14. I quote um, Isaiah 42.1, Ecce servus meus, suscipiam eum electus meus, complacuit sibi in illo anima mea, dedi spiritum meum super eum, judicium gentibus proferet. In English, behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. It is the beginning of the first servant song, Isaiah 42, 1, 9, where Isaiah depicts identity of the servant and his calling. According to Wanda Chizewski, although Aquinas that Although Aquinas does not discuss the connection between Philippians 2, 6, 11 and the figure of the servant of the Lord extensively, nevertheless, this connection is still more clearly outlined in his works than in the works by his predecessors, whose biblical commentaries he referred to. For instance, St. Thomas notes this parallel in his early Expositio Super Isaiam, where he recognizes the connection between Philippians 2.9, factus obedience, usque ad mortem, and Isaiah 53.10. Similarly, he points it out also in his later Super Evangelium Sancti Matei Lectura, where he refers to Isaiah 42.1. Therefore, it is worth to examine especially Aquinas' commentaries on Isaiah 42.1, which prove most clearly his recognition of connection between Philippians 2.7 and the figure of the servant of the Lord. Firstly, I'll, I shall briefly analyze Expositio Super Isaiah. St. Thomas interprets this whole passage in the light of the teaching on the threefold grace in Christ, which finds its fullness in him. 
Hence, according to Aquinas, if you read Isaiah 42.1 as a prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, servant of the Lord, then you may recognize that it heralds his specific identity and the essence of this identity is being bestowed in such an extraordinary way and in such an abundance that one may speak of plenitudo gratiae. This exegesis of Isaiah 42.1 endures in Aquinas' oeuvre, since it is repeated in his late work, namely Summa Theologiae. Passage from the commentary on Matthew 12.18.21, where Isaiah 42.1.4 is cited by the evangelist, contains similar theology. However, there are some new features introduced by St. Thomas here. It is worth noting that in this Gospel, Isaiah 42.1.4 is the longest citation from the Old Testament of tremendous significance as it identifies Jesus as the servant of the Lord. St. Thomas interprets this citation as referring to revelation of God's electio, dilectio and gratia in the servant of the Lord. God firstly elects Secondly, he loves. Finally, he bestows grace on the servant of the Lord. In the end of the, this exegesis on, of Matthew 12, 18, Aquinas writes down a very significant sentence. Et hoc in quantum habet formam servi. Hence, everything he stated about Christ while analyzing the Isaiah 42, 1, should be understood as referring to Christ's forma servi. So it is an integral approach to the notion forma servi that we encounter here, the approach which sees Christ's human nature as inextricably linked to the fullness of grace and truth. To conclude, first, the notion forma servi from Philippians 2.7 should be associated with the figure of the servant of the Lord from the prophecy of Isaiah. The second point. Since this notion was used by St. Paul in this part of Philippians 2, 6, 11, which concerns Mysterium Incarnationis, its best parallel may be found in Isaiah 42, 1, where identity of the servant is specified, rather than Isaiah 52, 13, 53, 12, which depicts the servant's passion. So the parallel to this latter passage can be found, according to Aquinas, in Philippians 2, 8, where Mysterium Passionis is discussed. Isaiah 42, 1, 4 is cited also in Matthew 12, 18, 21, what gives this text special significance in discovering the identity of Christ. For, according to Aquinas, in Isaiah 42.1, the servant is presented as having the fullness of grace. Five, therefore, the notion forma servi in Philippians 2.7 should be understood in integrally as well, namely, as a created human nature having all the weaknesses and defects needed to fulfill the work of salvation, but also full of grace and truth. Thus, careful reading of Isaiah 42.1 provides a bridge between the notion of forma servi in Philippians 2.7 and the Johannine approach to John 1.14. Third uh, uh, point significance of association per ideam. Analysis of this approach to Isaiah 42.1 allows us to recognize some general characteristics of Aquinas' way of citing Old Testament and citing Holy Scripture. While discussing the criteria of selection of citations meant to explain of given passage, Piotr Roszak observed that overall two cr such criteria may be distinguished terminological per verbum, per verbum et thematic per ideam. Per verbum. 
Quotation is selected on the basis of verbal associations. Such associations of various passages is not purely mechanical, but takes advantage of the fact that using the identical form of a given word allows to grasp some deeper affinity of ideas behind these quotations. Second, per ideam, quotation is selected in such a way that reveals the broader context of other even, even, events of the salvific plan. Therefore, external association per verbum is not necessary because it is one and coherent reality hidden behind different wording which links together various passages of the scripture. Hence, the citation is meant to reveal some reality hidden behind the excerpt which is being interpreted, the reality that can be denoted by various words. Now, how this classification can be helpful in understanding the way in which Aquinas uses Isaiah 42.1 to explain Philippians 2.7? This case is noteworthy as St. Thomas begins with capturing association per verbum, forma servi, exce servus meus. This is this association per verbum, what later allows him to grasp association per ideam. The idea that links both citations is the figure of the servant of the Lord. Once Aquinas captures this association, he is able to broaden his interpretation of Philippians 2, 6, 11 with passages referring to the servant of the Lord, especially with Isaiah 42, 1. The figure of the servant begins to shed some light on Philippians 2, 6, 11, not only in one specific aspect relating to Christ's passion and death, but also in general way showing Christ as electus, dilectus, and plenus gratiae veritatis. Hence, association per verbum is a starting point for capturing the idea which broadens and deepens the meaning of the notion for servi. For Aquinas believes that capturing this association between Philippians 2.7 and Isaiah 42.1 allows him to introduce a whole new level of interpretation. Before I conclude, I would like to juxtapose briefly this Aquinas exegesis with some approaches found in contemporary biblical studies. The whole passage, Philippians 2, 6, 11, and especially Philippians 2, 7, is among those texts from the New Testament that are the most difficult to interpret. So there is a great number of concepts trying to explain its theological meaning. Of course, I shall not discuss all of them here, but rather recall just one, which is the closest to Aquinas' approach. The similarity consists in recognition of, recognition of parallel with the figure of the servant of the Lord. Though the proponents of this concept differ with regard to details of solving this issue, what they have in common is the fact that in Philippians 2, 6, 11, they identify above all the reference to Isaiah 52, 13, 53, 12, and especially to Isaiah 53, 12. I quote, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Generally speaking, according to the proponents of this interpretation of Philippians 2, 6, 11, this passage refers mainly to Christ's passion and his death on the cross, rather than to the mystery of incarnation. Therefore, the notion of kenosis should be applied to Jesus' death, not to his incarnation. Although this association of Philippians 2, 6, 11 with servant songs is often criticized as overlooking differences between the context of these passages, I am nevertheless convinced that it is truly hard not to see deep affinity between servant songs and Philippians 2, 6, 11. Certainly, the degree of such correspondence may be discussed, but it is hardly possible to deny its existence. But Aquinas puts this affinity in broader perspective, linking Philippians 2, 6, 11 not only with passages on passion and death derived from servant songs, but also with the whole idea 
so to speak, of the servant of the Lord. This idea includes also his identity depicted in Isaiah 42.1 and Matthew 12.18.21. In other words, by citing Isaiah 42.1, Aquinas gave us a hint that the whole passage from Philippians should be regarded as referring to the identity and the whole history of the servant of the Lord, not only to some of its chosen aspects. This is the main difference between Aquinas and some of common contemporary commentators, analyzing Philippians 2.6.11, for it seems that St. Thomas was far more sensitive to associations per ideam than numerous present-day exegetes. Thank you very much.